Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Sia. I'm an alcoholic. Really so happy to be here. So, so happy. I I got a call to come here, and I thought, ooh, Pine Lake, that sounds really cool, you know, and... uh, (laughs) And then there were some little mix-ups like with my email, and then I didn't hear from you, and I was so bummed because I thought it kind of fell through, and maybe you found somebody taller, if that's possible, (laughs) or I don't know, you know, you know how we do. And, uh, and then Dawn called and here I am. And, um, you, I, I love the format of your meeting. I love what you do here. Uh, Mark's been a wonderful host and his children, not to call you out, but there you go. You, you're not anonymous at that level. And, uh, it was fun to run into Gene. And, you know, I have some folks I, I know here and, uh, and I'm grateful to be here. And, uh, so thank you for having me. I, um, Want to say happy birthday to those celebrating a birthday. Uh, I have a lot of sobriety thanks to Alcoholics Anonymous. And what I have come to know is this is on loan to me a day at a time. And, and I learned by watching you, uh, I, I owe Alcoholics Anonymous and it is why I'm here, but it is not begrudging. There have been times when I was begrudging and I may get to those places again. The bottom line is you taught me to just show up no matter what. Because my illness, my alcoholism was showing up no matter what. And I had few choices when I came here. They were limited. And you, you have changed my life. You've given me a life. I am one of those people who I, I don't really know if I would be here, alive here, without Alcoholics Anonymous. And if I was here, I would be very unhappy because I was very, very unhappy. So if you're new, welcome. And, uh, This is a great meeting, it seems to me, and I hope that you feel at home here, and uh, you may not. You may be uncomfortable. I've been uncomfortable in Alcoholics Anonymous, but uh, I did find an answer here. I'm not here to promote Alcoholics Anonymous to you. I don't think Alcoholics Anonymous needs promotion. We even have a tradition that we don't promote ourselves. But I will tell you that I am an AA success story, and uh, and I'm going to tell you what I used to be like and what has happened to me and what I'm like now because of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, you know, I used to say I did not feel a part of, and uh, that that is absolutely true. But at some point in this sobriety, I realized that what I felt I was saying is that I actually didn't identify in any of the places I think normal people do. Um, I, I didn't identify in my own home. I didn't feel a part of in my home. And, and this made me very uncomfortable. Uh, my family are really nice looking people. And I was this tall, skinny thing with buck teeth and scraggly hair. That was a direct quote from a police report. And, uh, <laughs> you know, not that I needed proof, but you know, there it was. And, uh, and, and this made me angry that I did not feel a part of. Uh, I don't know about you as an alcoholic, but I'm a very predictable person as an alcoholic without a program. Uh, anger and, and I'm going to drink eventually. And, uh, those are two things you can count on without, uh, AA. And, uh, it made me angry that I did not feel a part of in my family. And I'm a person who, uh, I overdrink, but I also overmarry. I, I overdo in a lot of areas. And, uh, one of the people I was overmarried to said to me one time, you know, um, I actually think you are the angriest person that I have ever met. To which I replied, that makes me angry. <laughs> To prove my point, you know, you can just, I have very limited skills on my own. In fact, I have come to say that I think my compass points to hell 
without Alcoholics Anonymous. And there's just no way around that for me. I cannot survive myself, and I cannot help myself. And and you have given me different tools, and, and you, you work those tools, you live those tools, and it has been that that has helped me in Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're new here, you're not a charity case. And, and that was a wonderful thing for me to understand. It's an even playing field here. It's one alcoholic talking to another. I, for some reason, am a person who is not helpable by professionals. Perhaps now that I'm sober, I can be, but uh, I, I am a deeply cynical person. This is my spiritual bankruptcy, and the book talks about that. And uh, it kind of plays out like this, for example, uh, where I don't care if you might have a badge and a gun. I don't care if you have that little collar around your neck. I don't care if you have this little piece of paper on the wall that tells me that you know a whole bunch, because you know what I do know about you? What I know about you underneath it all is you're just another lousy human being just like me. <sighs> you can't help somebody like that. You, you can't help me like that. And, and it's one alcoholic talking to another. I did not feel patronized, and, and I am not right about professional people, but I was not right about so many things. And I was saying to Mark when we were driving in that it has been a life-saving thing to find out that I am wrong. I, I appreciate being wrong, because if I'm right about life, I can't be here. I cannot survive life the way I understand it on my own. And Alcoholics Anonymous has changed my uh, perception. It has changed my ability to be among people. Alcoholics Anonymous, if you're new, is a living program. If you have come here from treatment, we've been waiting for you, loving you all the time. It, but treatment is the beginning, and there's nothing wrong with treatment. Bill Wilson himself went through treatment, but, but it's the living part that's hard for me. Once I get sober, there's still alcoholism, and that is a hard thing to grasp and understand. But I can grasp and develop the manner of living as we describe it in Alcoholics Anonymous to help me do that. And so uh, I did not feel a part of in my family. And uh, then I went to kindergarten, and it got worse. And uh, I, I'm going to talk about the malady. I, I have spiritual malady. And uh, I think I peaked at five. Uh, I went to kindergarten, and what was going on in kindergarten is there were these things called people. And what are they for? You know what I mean? And uh, they were looking at me like you're looking at me. And uh, I became like a mind reader in kindergarten. I don't know if you did that. And, and I felt like what these people who were looking at me were thinking, whatever it was, it wasn't good. But there were like too many of them to kill. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I just felt stuck. I felt stuck. And uh, this is what Alcoholics Anonymous calls the bondage of self. But I didn't know that's what it was called. And I was having an attack of self-centered fear, and I didn't have that language. All I can tell you is that uh, I was miserable, and this was the educational system. And I was stuck in this system, and I did not feel a part of in that system either. And I did not identify with the other kindergartners. Then I got involved with what to me was uh, a somewhat militaristic youth group. You would know them as Girl Scouts. <laughs> and uh, Girl Scouts and I did not work out. Uh, you know, we read traditions here, and we're not the only organization that has traditions. Girl Scouts has traditions, too. And I am not here to defame Girl Scouts. I want to say that. I'm just talking about my experience. I was taught in Alcoholics Anonymous not to put down any religion, not to put down anything maybe that I'd had a resentment against, because that is my problem. And because someone in the room may have had a wonderful time in Girl Scouts or in that religion, and I'm going to turn them off from the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. But I, I did not have a good experience in Girl Scouts because I don't respect traditions or authority without Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I'm a person who colors outside the lines. That is my nature. And um, Girl Scouts started to notice this. I, I do want to say, before I go on, that I actually ran into a former CEO of Girl Scouts uh, in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and I felt so vindicated. You know, like, see, Girl Scouts makes you drink, you know. <laughs> 
but uh, they started to notice that I really wasn't like those little merit badges. What do you, I don't want to merit them. You know, I don't wait for that kind of stuff. I just started slapping them on this little sash that they give you, you know, and um, this kind of made them unhappy. And I, I think the, the coup de grace was when Girl Scouts noticed that I was doing something funny with their cookie money. And, uh, you know, Girl Scouts takes this pretty seriously, apparently. I, I took some heat for this, and uh, they talked about it, whoever it was that would talk about it. And uh, the upshot was that I could no longer be a Girl Scout. And um, I don't know if they took that little green frock back, or I can't remember that part, but I was kind of drummed out of Girl Scouts. And... Um, Nobody took me aside that day and said to me, there's a little thing in the book if you're new, and it talks about this is the beginning of a fatal progression. Now, they're talking about the, the alcohol problem, but there's also that kind of parallels my life spiritually because they could have said to me, this is the beginning of a fatal progression, Sia. From here on in, every organization that you become a part of is going to uninvite you to be a member or a part of it eventually, because that would have been true. Uh, so that was Girl Scouts. Um, then I, I was raised in a particular church, and uh, church did not work out for me. I, I would say to you I did not identify in church because I don't think people who identify in church pull the fire alarm during communion. This is something that I did. Uh, I did not act alone, but nevertheless, that is what I did. And uh, you would have a different speaker here if my mother had not gotten between me and the Monsignor. And, and so I'm a problem person. I just am by nature. And uh, I used to blame that church. Uh, I used to blame people, places, and things for my problems. I didn't understand that the problem actually was not those things. I remember... Uh, coming to Alcoholics Anonymous and and feeling certain things had been different, I, I wouldn't be here with you. I remember sitting in a meeting where I go to meetings down there and thinking, you know, if uh, if I had a cooler car, I wouldn't have to be in this lousy meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd feel better about myself. I had a car when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous this time that my mother had given me out of the kindness of her heart, but it wasn't up to my standards, you know what I mean? And uh, I mention this because I looked around the room and got to know people in those meetings, and there are people in those meetings who are driving very cool cars. So it made me ask, what are they doing in Alcoholics Anonymous? And I remember thinking if I had been given enough love, I wouldn't have had to be in Alcoholics Anonymous. And then I saw people in the meetings where I was going who were married or, or who were in relationships. And, uh, and I wondered, what are those people doing in Alcoholics Anonymous? I remember thinking when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I had been a model before I came into Alcoholics Anonymous this time. That's what I called it. I don't know what you'd have called it if you'd seen me in action, but that was my story. Uh, but I remember thinking, you know, if I got a Vogue cover, I wouldn't have to be in this lousy outfit with these losers. You know, I would have amounted to something, and it wouldn't have come to this. And, and where I go to meetings, I looked around the rooms, and I saw girls who had been on Vogue. And so what were they doing there? And, and these things made me question. If I'd had enough money, I wouldn't have to be here. And I looked around the rooms, and there were people who made a lot of money in those meetings. So what, what is wrong with me? You know, what is wrong with me? Alcoholics Anonymous challenged many old ideas of mine. And I came to find out that all my life, I, I've been working on the wrong problem. You were the problem, and I was wrong about that. And, and I am the problem. I have accepted the proposition of Alcoholics Anonymous, because there's hope in that proposition, if you're new. There's hope in the proposition that if I change, my life can change. Whereas if you have to change, I have to wait for you. I have to wait for you to do that, and that makes me a victim. I used to have an alcoholic car. I don't know if you had an alcoholic car. And it had a busted windshield. And I used to drive down the street, and everything I looked at through that windshield looked busted. You know, the trees were busted, the people were busted, the sky was busted, everything was busted. But the only thing really that was busted was the windshield. And I have come to find in Alcoholics Anonymous that I have a busted windshield spiritually, and uh, you're the people that help me see life as it really is. 
that it is livable, that it is doable, and I need to come back here and renew that. But I didn't have that information in kindergarten, and I didn't have that information in church. And so uh, I did not feel comfortable in church for reasons I never understood. I always felt like dirt about myself, and my defiance comes into play here because I began to take actions to confirm it. And uh, I felt like I left the, the idea of God behind. Bill Wilson says something like that in the book. And uh, when I was 17 or 18, uh, I had my first drink. And uh, it was no big deal. It was at a local college watering hole. Uh, I was a little bit underage. Uh, there was smoke in the place and music and people and, you know, I'm uncomfortable around people, but there they were. And, and I was kind of excited and uh, and here's what I brought to that drink. I was afraid of the drink. The reason that I was afraid of the drink is I am one of the members of Alcoholics Anonymous who grew up in a home where drinking was a problem. It happened to be a problem for my father. Now, my father said he was alcoholic, and so I'm going to call him one. One of the things you also taught me to do here is to look to my own alcoholism, not to be calling anyone else alcoholic. And because my father said he was, I, I will say he was. And before I had the language of Alcoholics Anonymous, what I saw with my father was powerlessness. What I saw with my father, my father was a very big human being. And what I saw with my father is because of his drinking, because of his alcoholism, he lost most of his material possessions. And I lived with my father, and I know he did not want that to happen. And he couldn't seem to keep that from happening. And we say in Alcoholics Anonymous, it's a family illness, and it takes the family with it. And, and so the family got washed out right down the drain with my father. My father lost his place in our community because of his alcoholism. And uh, my father was powerless over this. And I lived with him. I know he did not want that to happen. And uh, he could not keep that from happening. And so when I approached this drink, uh, I wondered if something bad would happen to me. It was a beer. No big deal. And what I'm going to tell you is I don't know if it was the first sip of that beer or the middle of the glass or the bottom of the glass or the bottom of the pitcher or the bottom of the evening. I don't know. But somewhere in that evening, something happened for me, which to me meets what we talk about in Alcoholics Anonymous, what we call the effect produced. And in my case, in my own words, the effect produced was simply this, this feeling of not being a part of of not belonging, of not identifying in the crucial places it seemed to me that everyone else identified, the places where I'm like, why do I not belong in my family? Where is somebody? The words you can't say. You can't even describe it to someone else. It's too embarrassing. It's too frightening. That terrible feeling that dogged me day and night, that feeling sometime in that evening just quietly went out the back door. That's what alcohol did for me. And so what I'm going to tell you is that uh, if something does something like that for somebody like me, I'm going to get my hands on it as often as I can. And I began to drink as often as I could. Uh, I began to also take geographics. Uh, I grew up in Montana. We have reservations in Montana. And I would drink on the reservations. And I would drink on the reservations because uh, I don't know what your drinking was like. But I'm not predictable. Uh, I can be unfriendly. I can be overfriendly. I may take my clothing off at your wedding reception. <laughs> you know, I'm celebrating. <laughs> it's just not your idea of a good time, apparently. And uh, I, I am a problem person, as the book describes. And, and so on the Indian reservations, my, uh, they didn't have my family's phone number and they could not call them to complain about my behavior. And for me, that was a new freedom and a new happiness. Uh, <laughs> I began to have something happen which uh, I call assisted geographics. I named them because they started happening to me quite a bit. And assisted geographic is where people start helping you pack before you're ready to leave. And uh, this happened to me on numerous occasions. Uh, the first person of note that that happened with was actually my, my own mother. Uh, at this point in her life, uh, my parents had separated. At this point in her life, 
you know, I probably imagine my mother felt like her life was over. I, I'm a very self-centered person without the assistance of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and what that means is that if there is a problem on the table, if it has no immediate impact on me, if the house is burning down but my room is not on fire, nothing to do with me. I, I very much compartmentalize things. And so it, it didn't occur to me that my mother might be having a difficult time. I, I'm so grateful to have lived to the other side of myself here. But at that time, I was not an asset in our home. And my mother, there were financial problems. She's a single parent. Her marriage is over. And uh, there were other children younger than I in the home. And then there's me. And uh, when I drink and I get the effect produced, I, basically I think it gives me hope. And, and I, that's a wonderful feeling when you feel hopeless. And, and I chased that feeling. And, and I would stay out all night if I could. And, and then I would come home. And, uh, one of my brothers took me to task for arriving at that hour. And, uh, I don't know about you, but I'll kill you. I'll kill your whole family, you know, if you come at me like that. And uh, so my brother and I got in a fist fight in the morning, and my mother got caught between us. And, um, you know, it was just too much for my mom. I was the X factor, and, uh, and so I had to go. And now I am uh, drinking in Beverly Hills which is how I positioned it to myself. I say I probably drank in Beverly Hills for like about five minutes at the bus stop uh, on my way to hell or wherever I was going, you know. And um, I ended up drinking at uh, a place way down, if you know Los Angeles, way down past Western, way down past Western. Uh, the name of the place was The Good Night, and it wasn't, so I wouldn't look it up. That's what it was called. Uh, it was a rough bar. Should have just been called Rough Bar. <laughs> that would have been uh, true advertising. And uh, I drank in this bar for the same reason that I drank on the reservation. Although I did not know this until I did my inventories with you. Um, I drank in these places because the people there were very different from me. And what that did for me is it gave me a tangible reason why I felt so different from people. It was evidence, and I needed that, and it helped me. And the unfortunate thing is, I don't know about you, but when young women drink in rough bars, sometimes stuff happens. And uh, one night, uh, there was another young woman who drank in this bar. We were not friends, but we both drank, drank in the bar. Uh, one night, one of the two of us ended up with her head blown off, in the vacant lot behind the building this bar was located in. I don't know what kind of uh, violence was in your drinking. Uh, that was not characteristic of mine, and it frightened me. It frightened me for another reason, and, and that was that I was very much like Debbie. Her name was Debbie. Uh, I'm an obnoxious person when I drink. I seem to feel I've acquired important information about you, and, and I need to let you know what that is. <laughs> Maybe you're trying to watch a game, you know, or maybe you're talking to a friend, or maybe you're proposing to your future wife, but no, I, I need, I'm suppressing, you know, it's a burning desire, I guess, you know, and, uh, and so I, I'm a problem person that way, and an annoyance, and what I realized is that it, it could have been me, it could have been me just as easily as it was Debbie. And uh, this is when I, I tried to do what the book describes as I started to try to control my drinking, progressing. You know, when I said to people I was drinking in Beverly Hills, and when I said that to myself, it's that part in the book about whistling in the dark. You know, I had started to be uneasy about where my drinking was taking me. And now I reached a point where I, I thought, you know what, why don't you back off of this a little bit, Sia? Why don't you chill out? Maybe you've had more than your fair share. You know, why don't you give it a rest? I said that to myself. And uh, what I found out is that I did the same thing with myself that I did with anyone else who tried to control my drinking. I, I just started drinking behind my own back instead of yours now. And uh, it, it's kind of a funny thing to say, but it ain't funny. Uh, you know, I'm an alcoholic woman. And I have been out of control of myself physically, not aware of my surroundings, gotten in some terrible situations, and those were bad things. But personally, I have never had an experience where I no longer have a say 
in how my life is going. And that's what started to happen. My life started to go on with without me participating is how it felt. That is the terrible thing about alcoholism. I couldn't have called it that. I felt so helpless. I didn't know what to do about that. And uh, this is when obsession of the mind became the master. You know, it talks about king alcohol. It talks about the rapacious creditor. These are kind of crazy little things the book says, but they are very true in my case. And uh, I remember I I uh, had a couple of things that propelled me into Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, first of all, I was burglarized. But like I didn't notice for a couple weeks. I mean, come on, you know, who lives like that? And so I was in that bondage of self. It's like spiritual claustrophobia. It's like where you hate your own guts. And where are you supposed to go for that? So that happened. And the other thing that cued me up for Alcoholics Anonymous was that uh, one day I, I looked out of the window of the place where I was living at the time. And I happened to notice a man walking down the street carrying a shotgun. I'm from Montana. I know a shotgun when I see one. And it was daylight, and I thought that was pretty out there. And um, I'm lucky I noticed this person. And I have, again, lived to the other side of myself. You have given me the privilege of doing that. And I look back, and uh, although I had not had an experience with God, whatever that is to any of us, these things that I look back on, like that day, that coincidence of noticing this person, are things that are the reason that I am standing here tonight. Uh, and the reason I say that is because uh, when this man crossed the street, came into the courtyard of the building where I lived, and up the stairs to my door, I knew he had a shotgun, so I did not open the door. But I didn't know what to do. And uh, I stood there as quietly as possible, the moments ticking away, that long second. You know, it's like that second when you know you won't be able to say no to the drink, that second that lasts a thousand years. And you know it's going to be the same outcome, no matter how badly you would like it to be different. And I, I stood there in that moment behind the door, not knowing what to do, and uh Apparently, it just wasn't my time. Maybe there was too much commotion in the courtyard. Maybe he didn't want to draw attention to himself, blowing the door off the handle or kicking it in or whatever his intention was. I, I felt I'd never seen this person before. Maybe I had done something to him in a blackout, and that's what he was doing there. My mind was racing. Maybe it was because of the people I lived with, because I lived with those kind of people. And to be fair, they would have said the same thing about me, you know. And uh, it just wasn't my time because after what felt like a really long time to me, I heard him turn around, walk down the steps, and walk away. And, and this is the time when I really wanted help. I don't know when that moment came to you, if you're new, but it came to me then, and I didn't know how to get help. And I'm a person who's crippled by my alcoholic pride. I will not ask for help. I won't ask for help. And and it comes down to that thing, you want to be right or you want to live, Sia. And you know, there was something in me that wanted to live. And 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 I couldn't articulate it, but it was there. And uh, shortly thereafter, I, I was sitting somewhere, leafing through a newspaper, waiting for the obsession of the mind to hit, because that's what determined my day. And uh, there was something in the newspaper it talked about Alcoholics Anonymous, and it said that uh, we hold hands here, and we pray, and then we don't drink anymore. I think I remember something like that, and I'm telling you, it sounded as corny as hell to me. But you know, there was something else in me, some other voice, some other wish, some uh, I want to live, I want to go, I want to go. That's what I heard myself say. And uh, and so I went to this meeting, and uh, I think it was also a nice meeting like this one. There was someone at the door to greet. It was smaller than this. It was a daytime meeting. And, um, and the woman who greeted me gave me a phone number, and she said she would sponsor me. And I didn't know what that was, and I wasn't going to ask. And I walked in the meeting, and I went to the front of the meeting, and I sat down. And I had come to the meeting for help. And uh, and then I reverted to type, just like that. 
just like kindergarten. I got this attack of self-centered fear because there were people in the room and there seemed to be too many of them. And then I was too embarrassed to get up and walk out and I felt so stuck there, you know. And so I just sat through the meeting, sat, sat, sat. And when the meeting was over, uh, I got the heck out of there. And I didn't take your damn book and I didn't know your traditions and I didn't know your steps and I wasn't going to ask that lady to sponsor me. Uh, you know, I'd come for help and I aced myself out of it completely. But apparently I walked through the Agent Orange spirituality, I guess, that's Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. And uh, and I want to say if you're new here and you struggle with the word God in Alcoholics Anonymous, as I did, there are some things that helped me. I don't know if they'll help you. There was an old-timer who said to me, Sia, it's simply something that helps. In Alcoholics Anonymous, God is also anonymous just like we are. You know, we don't care if it's he or she or it to you. It's simply a power greater than yourself. And I had a power greater than myself. This was pointed out to me, which was alcohol. And uh, you weren't holding it against me, whatever label was on the bottle, that gave me the power to get through my day. And, and, and so why do we care whatever label it is that you put on this power greater than yourself? And uh, that created a placeholder situation for me that allowed me to be here and to develop whatever a spiritual program is, and I, I'm very grateful for that. But what happened to me that day is I think it felt like an hour or two hours after the meeting. Here's what I noticed. I noticed that that obsession of the mind, that thing you cannot pray away, pay away, run away from, talk your way out of, escape, dodge, you, the thing that will not budge for love or money, that, that thing was gone. And uh, I noticed this. And, and I was floored by this. And, and I feel I was given a moment of grace there, not to take credit for it, not to think I wised up or, or something like that. And, uh, I, I couldn't, I couldn't account for it. But I thought about the people in church and I thought maybe this is what happened for them with God. Maybe this is what God meant to them. I had had no personal experience in the church of a sense of God. But I had something happen now that made me question it. Uh, I would tell you that is the dividing line of my life, the before and after there. I've kind of been looking over my shoulder ever since is all I'm going to tell you. Uh, the unfortunate thing about that, however, is that I came to Alcoholics Anonymous thinking I had a drinking problem. And if you're here and you think you have a drinking problem, that's fine. Alcoholics Anonymous works very well for that. The only requirement for membership here is a desire to stop drinking. But it turns out I have this other thing that is called alcoholism, and it is a real thing in my case. And uh, what happened that day is uh, I felt my problem was solved. I felt incredibly grateful to Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you. You know, I mean it. And, and I thought, you know, uh, if something comes up, I'll be right back. That's how I thought also. And uh, alcoholism is very obliging because for two weeks I had this monkey off my back, this obsession of the mind thing, and I had the time of my life, a new freedom and a new happiness, and I, I was leaping out of bed. I was, it, it was a spectacular feeling. But uh, there is the spiritual malady. You know, there is the thing. It says the problem centers in the mind. And uh, I don't know if you've noticed that if you're new, but at some point I noticed that. And, you know, it occurred to me, that ain't in a bottle. That ain't in the past. That's now. That's tonight. That's what I'm doing here. My sobriety date's January 30th, 1983, and I'm incredibly grateful for that. But I come to Alcoholics Anonymous because I need Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm here to tell you what you did for me but I still need you. And I did not know that I needed you. And what I did is I went to what we call a slippery place, a place where I had not had a good experience previously, and I met with somebody who I had an unfortunate past with. And that combination proved to be a problem that day because I got angry at them. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm a resentment machine without this program. I'm a real problem factory, and I got so angry at this person that I drank again. 
And, and this is where the book talks about the spiritual malady. If the book is wrong, it should come out. Because what I'm referring to here is something called resentment. And, and the book says a really hyperbolic thing to me about it. It says something like resentment is the number one offender, which is a pretty high number. <laughs> and it says that uh, it destroys more alcoholics than anything else. That's an incredible statement and should be edited out if it isn't true. And in my case, it's absolutely true because uh, I blew my sobriety over that. They were probably fine. And, and, and then I tried to come back to Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I tried to get that thing to happen that had happened in the first meeting, you know, that surcease of the obsession. And, and, and it didn't happen. And I didn't know what to do. And I didn't have your book. And it didn't come to me, the information, that some of us have a spiritual experience of the educational variety, which is the kind where you do put the chairs away, where you do shake the other newcomer's hands. You don't have to care if they live or die. You know, that's what you told me. Your motive doesn't matter, Sia. It's an action program. The program will overwhelm your alcoholism. But you need to be here for that to happen. I didn't know that. And for some reason, I couldn't stay in the rooms probably because I didn't talk to you. Again, my alcoholic pride, and I didn't have that information, and I drifted out the door, and I was gone for uh, a long time. felt like a real long time to me. It was seven years, and, and my alcoholism progressed. Alcoholism does progress. Alcoholism is, is not a drinking problem. Drinking too much and getting drunk is not what alcoholism is. Anybody who drinks too much gets drunk. Alcoholism is something else, and I had plenty of time to find that out in that seven years. Uh, I ended up in London, and uh, this is where I was a model, as I mentioned to you, ha ha. <laughs> and uh, I, I showed up for a job, and uh, I don't know if you're a functioning alcoholic when you're drinking. I am not. Uh, I'm a member of the I Can't Club. I can't. And uh, that is step one in AA. It doesn't work very well out there. Out there, if you say I can't show up too many times for the job, I, I don't know about you, but I lose my job. Out there, if I say I can't show up too many times for the relationship, I don't know about you, but they file on me, you know. Out there, if you don't make the car payment, you don't pay the rent, I don't know about you, but I get the car re repossessed, and uh, I get thrown out of the, the place where I'm living. And so uh, I showed up for this job, and I had stayed out all night, as I like to do when I'm drinking, if I can. And I looked terrible. I have no idea why they went ahead with this, this uh, job, but they did. And we got the pictures back, and I saw these pictures. And you know something? I looked like an alcoholic is what I looked like. My face was bloated. My eyes were bloodshot. Not a vision for you, ha ha, you know, and uh, and uh, it's not the first time I had a bad day in that job. I had walked down runways with dresses on backwards. I, I walked out of my shoes, you know, and my agency had just had it with me, and they were like, get out, just get out of here. And uh, almost simultaneous to that uh, termination notice, the Bank of England called, and I was overdrawn at the bank. And, uh, you know, I thought I had a lot of money. I don't know if this is how it went for you. You know, just things were going on in my life that I didn't even know were going on in my life. And I lived here. And, uh, and so uh, I'm out of a job, and, and I didn't know what to do. And, uh, you know, there's a thing in the book that says, uh, God is everything or God is nothing. And I don't know about you, but God's everything to me when there's just nobody else to call. And uh, there was a woman in that business who had broken her anonymity to me, and uh, and so I gave her a call that day, and she took me back to Alcoholics Anonymous in, in London. And uh, this is my second time in Alcoholics Anonymous now. I've been to Alcoholics Anonymous three times. This is my third time. I don't know if there's somebody else in the room who's done that, but you know what? It stopped being funny after a while. It just wasn't a casual thing that that was happening. And uh, this was my second time in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I, I did a little bit more than I had the first time. 
unfortunately, there's a thing in the book about a request rather than a demand. And I was in the demand type of sobriety. And what I mean by that is I had some things I expected Alcoholics Anonymous to deliver. You know, I'm not going to drink and you're going to do this. It wasn't like I showed you my list or disclosed this to you. But it was things like I, I want this job or I want this back or I want that to happen. And uh, the day came and you had not delivered. And uh, I I got a resentment like I will do. And, uh, and I quit Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, there's another thing the book says... There's one who has all power. May you find him now. And uh, that day his name was Gerald. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> me and old Gerald went to Gatwick Airport, and um, he was buying tickets for us to, to take a geographic and get out of the country. And, uh, you know, I was waiting in line for him, kind of standing back. And uh, I think of this because um, I don't know what you did to try to stop drinking, but um, I thought I thought I'm going to do something wrong, and I'm going to go to jail because they make you stop drinking in jail, you know. And and but I thought about it a little more, and I realized if you can't stop drinking, see, and nobody can make you stop drinking. So basically, what's happening in jail, I guess, is that they're interrupting you, you know, which is just rude. And um, <laughs> I ain't doing it, you know. So 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 that that was that was out. And uh, but as I stood in line here waiting for Gerald, uh, I got interrupted. And I feel my higher power interrupted. And, and I don't care if you believe that or not, but I think that is the case. Because out of nowhere, these federales came swooping down, and they arrested Gerald. And uh, they arrested the tickets, too. And uh, that was more upsetting to me. You know, uh, it, it's that thing in the book, take a trip, not take a trip. <laughs> and I didn't have enough program for not take a trip. And... Uh, and so I reverted to type. I'm very predictable. I have very few tools. I went home, and I blew my sobriety. And of course, I would do that. But then I did something that I did not understand. Uh, I went back to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I wondered why I did that. I did not understand myself why I did that. I understand it now. But I didn't want you to tell me. I wanted to figure it out. And uh, and then the day came and I understood what happened to me. It, it is the most fundamental thing, the thing that I never had in my life, the thing that AA is predicated on, one alcoholic talking to another, identification. And, and at some meeting, and I don't know what meeting it was, or some place, some discussion meeting, somebody was talking about their feelings and their drinking like I'm trying to do here tonight. And in one of those places, I crossed that other invisible line for me. You know, there's the one between alcoholic and non-alcoholic. And then there's one for me where I'm here. I'm here. I mean, I can physically be in a room like this, but I'm not here. And, and something happened, and, and I identified. And, and what happened is Alcoholics Anonymous became my home. It, I got a feeling I had never had in my life of belonging, of that you understood and that I, I belonged here. You gave me a place here. And um, I was in trouble that day, and I came home. You know, I mentioned to you that I'm in the I Can't Club. I'm no different coming into Alcoholics Anonymous. I still can't. You know, I came in here, I can't stop drinking. I said, I can't stop drinking. And somebody turned to me and said, they can't stop drinking either. And here's the difference if you're new. The life or death difference, there are many in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's where I said it. I said it here. This is the place for somebody like me. That's the difference. And uh, and so I, I came to the meeting, and there was a stranger there, and... Um, I have a hard time telling the truth. Alcoholics Anonymous has helped me. Uh, a woman summed it up very nicely for me in my second sobriety, actually. I came in and started talking about myself, which I love to do if I don't have any program going for me, and sometimes even when I have a little program going for me. And she said, you know, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> She said, if you're an alcoholic, I already know about you anyway. You are a liar, a cheat, a thief, and a whore, okay? She said, but go in the meeting because you'll be sitting between a liar and a cheat, behind a thief, and in front of another whore, and you never have to be alone again. Thanks, lady, right? Uh, you know, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, that made an impression on me, and... Um, 
And so I, I came to this meeting, and there was a stranger, and my point is that I actually told this stranger a little bit more of the truth than I normally would because I was in trouble, enough so <clears throat> that they said to me, you know, Sia, if you have six months of your life to give, why don't you work the program as Bill sees it and not as Sia sees it? And uh, they weren't being a wise guy. They said it very quietly. And then they wrote a phone number down for me, and they said, maybe this person can help you. And then they walked away. And uh, I think I was standing at the turning point that we read tonight and that we read in most of our uh, meetings in Southern California, standing at a turning point. And I was going to ask God's protection and care with complete abandon. Or the unsaid thing is, I ain't. And, you know, I have stood with a lot of people in that moment because you helped me. And I've given my phone number to them because you gave me yours. And I have said to them what you said to me. You know, if I can help you out, give me a call. I'd love to try. And sometimes what they say to me is that they can't. And what I know, because I have been here a long time with you and I have learned more about rigorous honesty, <clears throat> is that's the wrong verb. The real verb is they won't. And that's another life or death difference in Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> I found there's a division of labor in Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know if you have. And, and what it is is this. I can dial a phone. You know what I mean? I can dial a phone. I can go to the airport, get on a plane, and come here because you invited me here. I, I can do those things. But what I cannot do is keep myself sober. I cannot do that. And, and it is such a gift to know that. I know that because you talked about your alcoholism. I know that because I identified. I know that to the innermost self that I am aware of today. I know that. And, and that is, that is what I'm doing here tonight. I am here to stay sober myself, you know, and, uh, and that day felt like a really bad day. There was no other offer on the table but this phone number. There was no job. There was, uh, uh, you know, I'd lost my family because of my drinking. Don't you love that expression, I lost my family? What corner did you lose them on, Sia? Uh, I, I lost my family because of my drinking. I got my family back because of Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't even want my family back, you know what I mean? <laughs> it, it's like Alcoholics Anonymous is a scary place in that way. But uh, So there was no other offer on the table, and if you're new here and you feel desperate, it's a terrible feeling. But you know what? It's a building block for somebody like me. As I said, this is my third time in AA, and, and I started to pay attention because I felt desperate, because somehow something was gaining on me, and it was in the book, and I heard you had talked about it, and, and it had been something you had gotten out of, and those yets were not yets. They were happening. They were happening to me. This was gaining momentum on me, and, and so I, I, dialed, I dialed the phone, and uh, this was a hell of a 12-step call. Uh, this was a stranger, and, and I don't like people, as I told you, without a program. And I am not calling a stranger. But, but things just aligned that day, and, and I did call this stranger. And uh, it reminds me of the thing in the book with Dr. Silkworth and the doctor's opinion. You know, Dr. Silkworth, if you're new, was this physician who treated us in the old days, when we were dying like flies and losing our mind, wet brains and all of that. And as far as I know, he never said to one person, it's too late for you, you know, step aside. Let me try to help somebody who's going to make it. He, he never said that. And uh, this one guy who shouldn't have made it, made it. And he comes back to thank Silkworth. And uh, Silkworth says something in the doctor's opinion, like he, he didn't even recognize this guy. He felt like he never met this person. Now, I mean, I thought about this, and here's what I came to. This is a doctor. You know, this is quite an intimate transaction, is it not? Where, where you take somebody's pulse, you, you, you listen to their heart. You're right there. And then he felt like he'd never even seen this guy before. But he says something like, the guy's voice was 
brimming over with self-confidence. The guy's voice was vaguely familiar, but now that's what was happening. It was brimming over with self-confidence. And this is exactly what I heard over the phone with someone I had never seen before. And they described to me something they found in Alcoholics Anonymous that I had not found, that there was, there was something that they had seen, that they had grasped and developed this into something that I wanted. I wanted it. And because they were alcoholic, it felt possible for me. And, uh, and, and, and this is why I have a sponsor, because a sponsor can see when my alcoholism gets in the way, you know, and, uh, I just got on a plane and I went to Los Angeles and, uh, like on bad out of hell airlines or something, I guess, you know, and, uh, and I got sober in the Pacific group, you know, one alcoholic yelling at another and, um, <laughs> Uh, and I, I love them. I, I owe them. You know, it, it is that quality that penetrated my obsession of the mind. I, I could hear them to a man. They would say, who's your sponsor? Where's your next meeting? What's your commitment? You know, I wanted to kill those people, but, but they, they helped me. They understood me. And, uh, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about going to that meeting, uh, the newcomer feeling of that. These people were kind to me. Uh, they put me up. They gave me rides to meetings because I didn't have a car. And uh, I remember going to, there's a big meeting, like this is your big meeting. There's a, a big Wednesday night meeting. That's our big meeting. And I went to this meeting the first time and uh, had been given a ride. And I walked in the door of that meeting and uh, had the same thing happen to me that happened in kindergarten. I got this attack of self-centered fear. There were too many people in the meeting, and they looked nice. They looked, they didn't look like alcoholics to me. I, and I just felt like I, I, I can't do this. You know, I, I can't do this. Just like when I was talking on the phone with this person, Clancy is who I was talking to. And, and he said to me, you know, if you, if you, if you're willing to clean up your act, maybe we can help you. And on that phone call, I didn't know what he meant by that. And I just couldn't bear to ask him because if he told me something I couldn't do, it was over, man. You know, I take geographics and suicide's the quickest way out of town for people like me. I happen to be as bad at dying as I am at living. And, and that's what I'm doing here tonight. You know, I'm from California. We have earthquakes there. And on a bad day there, I used to like park under a bridge, you know, just wait, just hope, just lame, so lame, you know. And and one day I had a really bad day and I overdosed, but like it was no dose, so we're still waiting, you know. And and so there's me, you know. And uh, and and so I, I walked in this meeting, the place I had come so far to be there with the solution. And, and I snatched defeat out of the jaws of victory because I got frightened. And, uh, the guy that gave me a ride noticed I was having like a psychotic episode and, uh, pretty much said to me, you know, you're already here. You might as well stay for the rest of the meeting. And I felt so screwed <laughs> because he had the keys to the car, you know, easy for him to say. And, and I had that feeling I had in that first meeting in kindergarten, you know, I sat in the meeting and I just couldn't wait for the thing to be over so I could go wherever the heck I thought I was going. And the meeting ended and, and I bolted for the exit and this guy stopped me and he said, you know, how would you like a coffee commitment? And I just felt like saying to this guy, how would you like me to kick your ass? You know, just couldn't stand it. Wouldn't say that, but that's how I felt. Just full of hostility, full of fear is what that is. And, uh, and so what the guy said to me, said that, and then I said to him, well, I couldn't take the coffee commitment because I was only going to be there two weeks. You know, I would love to have asked the person that I was that night, where are you going, Sia? Where you got left to go? You know, at, at that point in my uh, drinking career, I don't know what your resume looked like, but here's what mine looked like. I told you my family had disowned me because of my drinking and behavior. I'd lost my job. Uh, I'd been uninvited to one entire country, thank you very much, because of my behavior while there. Um, I, I had a lot of problems. Uh, the one thing I really did not want anybody to know about dearly did not want anybody to know about is the fact I happened to be married to two people at the same time. Uh, this was 
I don't know, it was like something I tried to treat like an accounting problem, do you know what I mean? And uh, the parties involved just wouldn't go for it, they wouldn't cooperate, they're like, what do you mean you lost count? You know, that's not a high number, Sia, one, two. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I had no explanation for my life anymore. I had none, none that I could buy. And that's kind of the end of the line, you know. And, uh, and so with all of that going against me, I said to this guy that I couldn't take it because I was only going to be there two weeks. And what he did is he said something that saved my life. It didn't feel like he saved my life then, I'll tell you. But he said, okay, then take it for two weeks. And I was so taken aback, you know, I couldn't come up with a lie fast enough. And then I felt kind of stuck. You know, I felt stuck. I felt screwed, pardon my language. And uh, here's what that guy did for me. This was a spiritual transaction, if you're new. I, I have had trouble acquiring the spirituality of AA because I can't see it. You know, I, I can't see identification. It's a feel thing. And a spiritually bankrupt person like me, or emotionally illiterate, or whatever you want to call it, how I walked in here, I, I'm not that good with that stuff. But, but here's what this guy did for me. He, he, uh, it, it, it's the $100 word in Alcoholics Anonymous for somebody like me. It's the unicorn of my sobriety. It is what I protect against all things. I am the, 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 the location of a miracle. There's a pilot light here, and I want to keep it going, and that's why I'm here tonight. And it is simply surrender. I, I think the sobriety in that room overwhelmed my alcoholism. And, and I think I couldn't think of anywhere else to go. I just couldn't think of it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't go out there one more time and find some other place, some other geographic. It just was over, man. And, and it felt so bad, you know. It, it felt like uh, drowning to me is what it felt like. <clears throat> I happened to be an excellent swimmer. And, and I almost did drown one time. And, and I... It compares to that for me. You know, it was a situation, I underestimated it, just like alcoholism, and I still underestimate it. And then suddenly, I was drowning. And you know, your body doesn't ask for permission to live. It fights. It fights, it fights, it fights, it fights. And then there's just nothing left. There's nothing left. And uh, my body just gave up and was drifting down wherever it was going to go. And uh, out of nowhere, felt like out of nowhere, there was something to stand on. So I could get my head out of the water and get a breath of air and live. And, and, and that's what Alcoholics Anonymous is to me, the unexpected miracle of that. And uh, it doesn't come like a flash of lightning for me. It, it, it's a quieter thing. It is a solid thing. It, it has given me a life here that uh, I... I'm not able to live this life. I, I'm not able to work, but I work. I work in a place, I was telling Mark, with, with young people. I work in a place where there's a liquor supply. I never think of it. I never think of it. And if I think of alcohol, I call my sponsor. Because I'll tell you this, as much respect as I have for Alcoholics Anonymous, I have the equal amount of respect for alcoholism. It takes people out, people with time, new people. It takes us out. And alcoholism, we talk about the anonymity of the program. I find alcoholism anonymous too, because it does it in these ways that don't look like alcoholism, because I'm not drinking today. But the problem does still center in my mind. And, and this is why I, I work this program. Uh, I have about three minutes left by my estimation. I, I want to talk about um, maybe one other thing. You know, I got married in sobriety, and uh, that is quite a, really something for a person like me, I think. I'm, I'm not a faithful person without a program. I, I am a person who, as an alcoholic woman, I used abortion for birth control. Uh, I'm not saying that as a political statement. I'm saying that to you because it was something I absolutely did not believe in doing, and I did it again and again and again, and, and I could not be a real partner with another human being, as the 12th step says. That's quite an indictment. You know, there are many things the book describes that are hopeless things except for Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and I got married in Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, you taught me it's like a closed meeting. You know, you go home, <laughs> stuff like that. And uh, 
and uh, both of us had been secretaries of the same meeting, and, uh, and one day he came to me and he said he did not want to be married anymore. And, and this is where life will happen. You know, life happens. And, uh, and uh, you know, I didn't want to tell you. And what you have taught me is that's the time to tell people. Tell people if you think about a dream. Tell people something if you don't want to tell them. That's why I have a sponsor. I can tell my sponsor anything. And so I went to a meeting immediately, and I told the meeting that my husband wanted to leave. You know, it was pride. It was like that made me something to have this marriage. And uh, a woman came up to me after the meeting, and she said when her husband left, she drank. I thought, thanks, lady. But but here's what she did for me. Here's Here's what she did for me. Here's what you do for me. When stuff is going on, do AA anyway. And what that woman helped me realize is this is my primary purpose. I didn't come to Alcoholics Anonymous to get married. I didn't come to Alcoholics Anonymous to make friends. I didn't come to Alcoholics Anonymous to get a job. I didn't come to Alcoholics Anonymous to get my family back. I came here because I was unable to stop drinking. I am unable to do that on my own. And what has happened because I have worked this program is things have come into my life as my higher power, as I understand whatever that is, brings them in. And so this was something simply to go through and... uh what happened is my sponsor helped me not kill this person and 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 show up and be a dignified person and a, and a very interesting thing happened i'm going to tell you and if it's not interesting to you so be it um you know divorce is a violent thing and uh we were very angry at each other and we did not speak for some years he moved away and then he came back to los angeles to the meeting where we had both been secretary and he took a cake, and he stood up at the podium, and he made an amends to me in front of the meeting. And he said that I had a wonderful program, and he said some things to me that I, I don't know that I didn't, I didn't know that I needed to hear them, but I heard them from him. And uh, when he came down, all the anger that I felt was washed away, and he has since shared that with me from his side as well, and we hugged. And uh, this was a beautiful thing. And, uh, and then he was diagnosed with a, a fatal illness. And uh, he called and he asked me if I would be able to come and help him for a week. And uh, I don't know what I look like to you standing up here, but I ain't Florence Nightingale, I'll tell you that. And uh, and I didn't want to go. I was scared. And uh, an Alcoholics Anonymous went with me. Some people even gave me money for the plane ticket because he lived in New York. You know, well wishes, etc. And I went there, and it was it was a terrible experience. It was extremely difficult. And, and I did it with your help. And, uh, I was there for a week and I made my best friend angry. I was supposed to speak at the Atlantic group and he was too sick to do that. And so I felt terrible about that. By the end of that week, I felt about as popular in New York as Osama bin Laden, I think. And, and then, uh, to cap it all off after going through all of that stuff, the son of a bitch lived, you know? <laughs> It is funny, isn't it? And and uh, and I, I bring it up to leave you with this. What Alcoholics Anonymous did for me, among many other things, is you helped me not take myself so seriously. I was going to die of myself. Do you know what I mean? You helped me not take myself seriously. You helped me take Alcoholics Anonymous seriously. And I'm just incredibly grateful for the 12-step call. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.